From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Supreme Court takes up a big new gun case as Joe Manchin says he won't seek re-election from West Virginia, but will try to start a movement among the middle. Welcome. I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnists Kim Strassel and Bill McGurn. In a big week with elections and a Republican presidential primary debate, we are playing a bit of catch up on the Supreme Court, which on Tuesday heard another big case on the Second Amendment. This one was U.S. versus Rahimi. It is a appeal by the federal government and not the set of facts necessarily that you would want at the Supreme Court if you're an advocate of the Second Amendment. It involves a Texas man named Zaki Rahimi, who had a physical altercation with a girlfriend in a parking lot, after which he fired a gun at a witness that he saw there. The result was a domestic violence restraining order issued against him. After that, he had a series of other incidents with firing at a, a driver at a Whataburger fast food joint when a friend's credit card was declined, according to the court record. And the result of this was a conviction on a federal law with 73 months in prison as the sentence, because this federal law says that if you have a domestic violence restraining order issued against you, you are not allowed to possess a firearm. And Kim, part of the question here is, what is the level of process that is required in order for someone to lose a constitutional right, such as the one under the Second Amendment. And let's listen to a clip here of Chief Justice John Roberts tangling with the lawyer for Mr. Rahimi, Matthew Wright, over this question. Are you suggesting if there's a sufficient showing of dangerousness, that can be the basis for disarming even with respect to possession in the home? Again, it's a, it's a much closer question for me because it is. I have yet to see a, a historical example of that applied against a citizen. Um, and it would certainly be a last resort type of situation. So, Well, to the but, extent that's pertinent, you don't have any doubt that your client's a dangerous person, do you? Your Honor, I would want to know what dangerous person means. At well, the I moment. mean, someone who's shooting, uh, uh, you know, at people, uh, that's a good start. So, so it, <laughs> that's fair. Kim, how do you size up this case? This is an important case because it's a different type of case than what we've had in front of the court. And let's hail the court for actually beginning to take the Second Amendment seriously. We had the landmark Heller case, which did define the Second Amendment as an individual right to own a firearm. More recently, we had the Bruin decision, which said that your right to own that gun and possess that firearm did not end at your front door. This is a different case. This is not necessarily the type of case that most people think of the Supreme Court dealing with, which is more recently cases that have to do with what kinds of firearms are allowed. This gets to the question that some people have brought up about so-called assault weapons bans, etc. This is instead a case saying in what situations and under what procedures is a government allowed to disarm an individual? And the nub of this case is the question of protective orders, which often are arrived at via a civil process. So we have laws on the books right now that say that if you are convicted by a jury or a court of a violent crime, you can be disarmed. This is a different case. This is a situation in this 1994 law where judges, often civil judges, can issue these protective orders or restraining orders. And then by extension, the argument is that you can no longer own a firearm. There are questions, and the Fifth Circuit brought this up when it reviewed the case. And by the way, it did vacate the conviction against Rahini for owning a weapon, even though he had a protective order. They went through this and did find some issues with the civil process, in particular noting that, for instance, Rahimi, when he was dealing with this. He'd not been able to have his own lawyer. He didn't have a right to appoint counsel. So there were some questions about whether or not his rights had been fully aired in court. This is what the court is trying to get to, whether or not all of that provision in the 1994 law should stand, whether or not they should be trying to carve it up in a different way. Maybe they let this conviction stand, but they throw out some of the other circumstances in which protective orders might apply if there are not a certain amounts of process involved. This is what people are watching for to come out of this court decision. To underline that point, I don't think there is much legal debate that it is constitutional 
to disarm people who are convicted of violent crimes. And so one way you could imagine the government moving, prosecutors moving to disarm Mr. Rahimi or people like him is by taking any of that conduct that I listed before, including firing a witness to a physical confrontation with a girlfriend and convicting him on those charges, or even, I think, charging him. And then if he gets out on bond on bail, you could have some sort of conditions of release that restrict his ability to possess firearms, given the obvious dangerousness that he poses to the people around him. But to underline what Kim said, one of the things that is notable in the Fifth Circuit opinion, there's a concurrence by Judge James Ho. And he says that protective orders, quote, are too often misused as a tactical device in divorce proceedings. He also suggests that there are instances where you end up with two parties before a judge and he issues both of them a protective order. So you have dueling protective orders for each party. And in that case, if this federal law applies, saying that neither of them is allowed to possess a firearm, you could end up in situations where a victim or a potential victim is disarmed because the protective order goes both ways in that situation. So, Bill, the way that I saw this argument playing out, it seems to me that there's probably a majority of votes on the Supreme Court to uphold this conviction of Mr. Rahimi. You heard Chief Justice John Roberts there zeroing in on the point about dangerousness. And as Kim suggests, that's one way that the court could potentially go is saying that these kinds of protective orders can disarm Americans and can cause people to lose their Second Amendment rights if the judge finds a specific finding of dangerousness, if there are certain due processes in place that make it less likely that they'll be abused. So I think this is an interesting case, Bill, because I think I can foresee who is going to lose here, and that's Mr. Rahimi. But there seems like there are different legal ways that the justices could cut it. Yes. And that's because they haven't got into this kind of nitty gritty. Look, no one thinks this guy should have a gun. And as you say, it's not that controversial if they're convicted of a crime that they then lose their Second Amendment rights. What we have, and you mentioned dangerousness, and that's fine. We all understand that in principle. But The danger of dangerousness is who decides that and on what basis. In a divorce proceeding, if your ex-husband says you're a menace and so forth and you've threatened, are you deprived? So I think what's going to happen is the real questions will be on due process and to minimize the prospects for abuse so that all of a sudden we don't have people being stripped of their constitutional rights because someone accused them of being dangerous. I mean, it's kind of like the dispute over forced treatment for people, put them in mental hospitals. People used to be sent to a hospital or an institution, and they never heard from them again. There has to be some kind of review, and I'll be very interested to see where the justices come down because it's very tricky. I don't think it's obvious. It's obvious on the principle. We don't want dangerous or mentally ill people to own guns, but it's not when you get into who makes that determination, how long is it for, you know, is it for life? And we want to make sure it's not just based on an accusation. The other interesting thing about this case, Kim, is that it could shed some new light on a test the Supreme Court put forth last summer in the Bruin decision by Justice Clarence Thomas. That was a decision that I think the merits of it were pretty clear. The argument was that the Supreme Court goes outside a person's front door, so there is some sort of right to carry in public. But the Supreme Court also announced a new test basically saying that in order to uphold gun laws, the government would have to show that they are consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And so you've seen lower courts grappling with this and trying to figure out how to apply it. Let's listen to a clip of Justice Elena Kagan asking that question again to the lawyer for Mr. Rahimi. And I'm just going to read you a sentence from the brief, and I want to know whether, you know, that's your essential argument. It says, uh, the government has yet to find even a single American jurisdiction that adopted a similar ban while the founding generation walked the earth. So is that what we should be looking for? And uh, if we don't find that similar ban, 
we uh, say that the government has no right to do anything? Your Honor, I think that's largely what Bruin says. Um, However, I don't think it has to be so narrow. So if the government could affirmatively prove from the historical tradition of either uh, American firearms laws or even I would be willing to spot them the way that we have treated other fundamental constitutionally protected rights. If they could tie it to one of those historical traditions, that would be good enough under the logic of Bruin. So, Kim, one of the questions here is when courts go looking for historical analogies to a law that's being challenged in front of them, how close do they have to be? I don't think they have to find a law somewhere where the founders say, if you shoot off a gun at a Whataburger restaurant, you can lose your Second Amendment rights. But is it close enough if it's something that applies to people who are just dangerous or people who are proved dangerous in a criminal process, whereas this is a civil process? What is the level of analysis? I think there's a lot of judges around the country who would love some more guidance from the Supreme Court on that. The left has jumped all over this because they'd like to do anything to undermine the Bruin decision the Heller decision, which they resented because the justices and the majority in that case did go back to the founding and try to interpret to a certain degree the Second Amendment based on the way the very important idea that the founders had of the importance of firearm ownership. Now, I would note that I think this is a bit overwrought, these arguments that they make, because what they'd like to do is suggest that because there isn't a direct historical comparison, that just shows that somehow all of these rulings are bogus and you should just have a living constitution where you make it up as you go. I would note that the justices who come up with these opinions were more thoughtful than that. And if you read the actual line in Bruin that Clarence Thomas wrote, it said that firearms law need to be, quote, consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation, end quote. And those words matter. He didn't say the founding tradition. He said historical tradition, which suggests that it can take into account laws and norms over time. Now, we do have on the books a somewhat similar situation from times past. We used to have what were called surety laws in which someone who was a threatening person could be made to post a bond before being allowed to bring a weapon into the public. Now, the other side would argue that even though such restrictions existed, they had limits that stopped at the door of firearm ownership, meaning that while, yes, you might have been required to have posted a surety bond, as long as you did so, you still were able to own your firearm. But my point being here is that we clearly have traditions and historical precedents in this country of making decisions about whether or not some people pose a threat and Therefore, if we should be having a discussion about those people's ability to wield firearms in public. And I would wager that most of the justices who are looking at that are going to try to make a judgment based on that. Now, I do think to echo Bill's point that there's a very strong argument here for a majority of the court to think very carefully about broadly agreeing with protective orders, because often they are the product of civil proceedings where there isn't a lot of ability for those who are the targets of those civil proceedings to push back or to exercise their own due process rights. Too often they're used as tactical maneuvers in messy divorce proceedings and other cases. So the justices need to be aware of that. But the broad argument that somehow there's nothing in history that suggests they can go down this road, I think is wrong. And yes, I think that the very nature of the fact that this case has been brought up in front of them suggests that lower courts are looking for some greater guidance on where those limits rest. Mm-hmm. 